All right, thanks, Rob. I'm really happy to be here with you all. And uh, I have some really cool stuff that I like to talk about that includes this topic, but also many other topics. And so when Rob talked about me trying to decide, it really was a hard decision because I have lots of things that I like to talk about when given the chance. But these students are primarily the thing that swayed me because, you know, our students cycle through and then pretty soon they don't know the history of what they're doing or what we're doing here. So I figured, well, there will be some old timers here and they'll already know some of this, but I'll bet for some of you I'll have some details that you may not know either. I'm delighted to see Rufus here because he can fill in all the details. <laughs> Rufus, you came in 1970? 74. 74, that's right. I've asked him that at least 20,000 times. <laughs> so if you haven't noticed, you need to open your eyes and notice, but um, I think you will probably very easily notice by paying attention to what's going on around Bozeman that there's a lot of optics in photonics. And that, that word photonics might be new to some of you. Um, photonics kind of obviously has a, a reminiscent sound to it from electronics, and that's not by accident. The idea is that photonics is the merger of electronics and photons. So lasers and detectors and things that use electron, electronics and light, whereas optics is kind of the general broader category that just includes everything that, that works with light. And we have a tremendous amount of work going on both at, on campus and in the industry locally and that's why I thought this might be a good topic to, to bridge the gap between everybody and bring everybody together. So um, these are pictures of what's going on on campus, just some highlights. I mean, there's, I could fill many, many slides of pictures of everything going on on campus. This will not be primarily a talk about what's going on on campus, though. This will be primarily a history talk of how did we get there. And that's really important to do. I happen to like history. I don't remember particularly liking history when I was in high school. The only time I remember getting excited about history was my father went on sabbatical. I was a university brat, and my father went on sabbatical, and we lived in Switzerland for a while. And during that trip, I went and visited places like Florence, Italy. And then I came back and took, took a class of, on the Renaissance, and I was like, oh, you know, textbook, page 32, picture, I've been there, I, I stood right there and looked at that, and so then I got excited about history. So that's what I've learned, is that history is exciting when you're connected to it somehow. So that's what I want to do, is try to connect you to it. So how did Montana become a major home of optics and photonics? We have dozens of companies, we have a couple dozen at least, people around campus doing optics and photonics. and. Did MSU help, and if so, how? Those are kind of some of the questions that I want to pose and, <clears throat> and talk about tonight. Now, some of you, in this crowd, I may not get this reaction, but I remember when I first came, Rob has the easy job of, of remembering when I came to Bozeman, because like he said, we came one year apart. And so all he has to do is remember when he came and subtract one, and, and he remembers. But I remember when I first came here, I started going to optics conferences, because that's what I do. And I'd go to the conference and people would look at my name tag and just go, what? Montana? And before that, I was in Boulder, Colorado, and nobody ever had that reaction about Boulder. They are just like, well, of course. But when I came here, it was like really strange. And so this is the reaction we get sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope that by the time we, we're done tonight, you won't have that reaction. So why Montana? It sort of starts with the invention of the laser in 1960. Um, in May of 1960, Ted Maiman made the first ruby laser actually work. And this is Maiman with his laser. And you might say, well, what's our connection to that? Maiman was not an MSU professor. He was not from MSU. Nobody here was. But I'm going to tell you the connection in a minute. I recently learned something that I never knew before, which is that I always envisioned Maiman's effort being a highly funded 
high priority research task at Hughes Research Lab. Turns out he wanted to do this and his management just sort of thought it was a, not really appropriate. So they finally got him to shut up by giving him 50K in nine months to go work on this little pet project. And that's, I did the math today just to get an idea and it's, you know, 430 or so K. Even by today's standards, that's, I mean, spending 400K in nine months, that's, that's a modest research project, but it's not a huge one. And so think about the impact of the laser. I don't know how to, I don't know how to quantify that, but I'm sure if you were to make a list of the most important inventions of the 20th century, the laser would be in the top five, unless, unless you want me to take you out back and beat you up. <laughs> No, you, maybe it's not on the top five in your mind, but in my mind it is, because it, it touches every part of our life, literally. The cars we drive, the music we listen to, the internet that we use, the phone calls that we make, all of these things interact with lasers. And so it has gone from a little weird thing to a major piece of technology that, that drives the technology uh, economy. So. This is where he was doing it, is in Malibu, California, at the Hughes Research Labs. That's not Montana, so what's the connection? Well, Rufus knows the connection, and some of you might know the connection. The connection is Ralph, Ralph Hutchison. He was working at Union Carbide Corporation, and he came into work, I love to hear him tell this story. He says, you know, I came into the work and had this work order on my desk with you know parallel faces for this ruby crystal and polished to this kind of accuracy. Nobody knew how to do that, much less verify that they had done it. And so he polished it by hand, did all the finish polishing by hand of this little piece of ruby and sent it back to Ted Maiman at Hughes Research Lab and, and the rest is history. So the, the laser worked and um, this is Ralph in later years. This is just about five years ago when I had him here doing a video recording. And this is this piece of material that he's holding is a piece of ruby crystal and, and that um, he doesn't carry this one around with him, but, but he carries little pieces around to show people that this is kind of what it was like. So what's Ralph's connection to Montana? He was born in Montana. He was born up on the High Line in Haver. And that's okay, but even better, he's a graduate of this university, sort of. There's probably a handful of you that know what MSC is, right? Montana State College. Montana State College. My father graduated from Montana State. Actually, they changed it the year he graduated, so I'm not sure if he got a degree. I guess he, he got a degree from Montana State University, but he always said that that's when they ruined it. <laughs> it was Montana State College before that. So, anyway, he got a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering, 1954, almost 10 years before they changed the name to Montana State University. And he went to Union Carbide and, and started doing interesting things. And one of the interesting things he did was grew the first laser crystal. And years later, then he ended up back in Bozeman and he started a company to do laser crystals here. And so, hold that thought. We'll come back to that. Um, yeah, so I was going to point out that that was in Indiana, not Montana. So we're still not in Montana yet. So here's where the story starts that I want to tell, which is, you know, why we do optics here in Montana. In the late 80s and early 1990s, people like Rufus were here teaching people about lasers. And John Carlston had just come here, the newcomer from... Um, Los Alamos, and John was building up a big laser lab. He brought a bunch of laser equipment with him from Los Alamos that they kindly let him bring. And Rufus tells the great story about you know hand making everything in his lab in the old days, and those are great stories. And we have a lot of them on video re recordings, and it's it's really wonderful. And so Rufus and John were here, and they were teaching about lasers and te and using lasers in their labs. And students were getting familiar with lasers. And so you combine lasers with education and research, and what do you generate? You generate graduates. They get a degree. 
And then what happens? They go get a job. Guess where they would go to get a job? <clears throat> Everywhere but Bozeman. Everywhere but Montana. And so the problem was is that these students were telling John and Rufus and these guys that, hey, this is cool stuff, but there's no jobs. And so the wheels started turning, and I'm sure I'm simplifying this story, but I've, I've given this in front of John, and, I, and he at least agrees that I got it mostly right. So the simple solution, the simple idea of the solution emerged through partnerships and through ski. We don't ever want to forget the importance of ski. So here's John. John Carlston was a professor in physics, colleague of Rufus's, and he went to the ski hill. This is Bridger Bowl, if you don't know. And if you don't know, you better get familiar with it. And then this is Larry, Larry Johnson. John went skiing, and Larry happened to go skiing the same day, and they sat down to eat lunch, and they shared a table, and, you know, started up a conversation. Well, what do you do? I do lasers. No kidding, what do you do? I do lasers too. Mm -hmm. So now we have two guys in the town, plus a few others that are doing lasers. And then we have the uh, vice president for research at the time, and a guy that was going around promoting the EPSCOR program, which some of you might know is a kind of a, a academic equalizer. It's a program where the National Science Foundation and other funding agencies have a little piece of their budget that's allocated to go to these states that don't get their as big a share as California or somebody does. And so some of you might know these, these guys. They're, they're both, um, he's in town at least. And so these two guys started talking about this partnership that was going on with John and Larry they had a tiny little collaboration, nothing big, just a little tiny collaboration. And so John has his well-funded lab with his basic research projects. And I don't ever want to lose track of that, that these guys are doing basic research. Because a lot of times we lose track of that and we think the way to grow companies is to get rid of the basic research and do applied stuff. That'll break it because you have to have the basic research to have tomorrow's applications. And in a corner of his lab, then, John told me he had one table that was set up just sort of with his pet project. And there was a little project that was funded at a modest level by Larry's small fledgling company. And they were just doing some practical things together, investigating diode lasers and, and their control and their stability. And these guys took note of that and said, hey, this is really cool. You're working with industry and that doesn't happen enough. And so why don't, we, why don't we promote more of this? And there was more of it going on that they probably didn't know about. But So what they did is then they encouraged John to write a proposal to the NSF EPSCOR program. MSU in the state of Montana had to kick in some money. And the solution was a new program and a new center that was officially recognized in, in 1995 by the Board of Regents called the Optical Technology Center. And so its official founding date is 1995, but it was actually getting legs under it for a couple years before that. And then here's a copy. I'll bet you don't know that I have this. This is something that I grabbed literally as John Carlston was cleaning out his office and he was getting rid of it. And I said, John, give that to me. This is the proposal that went into the NSF. And Rufus was part of it. There's John Carlston, Rufus Cohn, Lee Spangler, and Fred Cady. A lot of you probably know Fred, and he, he was a great colleague for a short time of mine. So this is the cover sheet for that proposal, and it doesn't have a date, but it was, it was November of 1992, November something, I don't remember the exact date, and it's, it's a proposal for 60 months, $1 million, rounded off, you know, $1 million and 33 or whatever, so it's... It's basically one million over five years. And that sounds like a lot of money until you do the math and you realize, wait a minute. A million dollars over five years, you know, this is my academic brain kicking in. I know how to do these things. We, we're used to this math of saying, ooh, 
million dollars and then realizing, oh, I'm going to get 50K. Because you take a million dollars and you divide it by five years, and that's 200K a year on average. Then you divide it among four people, and that's 50K a person. And it's even worse than that. So it's not a whole lot of money, but it's an important investment of money. And then here's a direct quote from the... Well, yeah, <laughs> but I'm just saying the piece that each individual gets is 50K, and that's not so much money. I mean, maybe it's okay. But. So here's, here's a direct quote from that summary of that proposal. This proposal will support the formation of a group in optical science and laser technology at Montana State University. Well, big deal. Well, it is a big deal because of the next part. The prime objective of the group is the development of nationally competitive optical programs that have the possibility of leading to technology transfer, and then dot, 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 to have a significant impact on the economic growth of the state. Now, it's not every day that you see an academic write a proposal whose primary objective is technology transfer and economic development. But that's one of the special things about this proposal. And the other special part of it is that a big part of the money wasn't going into the pockets or the labs of these guys. It was going into hiring people like me. And so I like that. So what did it accomplish? Well, here's how the budget was summarized in, at the proposal stage. And I'm sure details changed over the years. But, but this is what the summary was. Years one and two had just fairly mod very modest support for four faculty members and five grad students. <clears throat> I don't know if you guys arm wrestled over who got the fifth grad student, but I don't, do you remember, Rufus? It probably just depended on who, was, who had it. Yeah, who had a project going. Year three, though, is when the real magic started to happen. There's faculty, grad students, and a postdoc. Yeah, yeah, that's normal stuff. This is the good part. New faculty member, new faculty member, new faculty member each year. If you want to make a long-lasting impact at the university, what do you do? Even at a company, what do you do? You hire a really good person because then you have that really good person hopefully for a long time doing great things. And so the small amount of money that was invested in hiring these people has, I actually did the math once and I've, I forgot to bring that, but I did the math once to sort of estimate how many times that money has been paid back, and I mean, it was a huge number, because I know who these people were, and they're very productive people. So the NSF put in a million dollars. MSU actually had to put in almost two million dollars, because there was a match required. And some of that was what we call funny money, meaning you know, we count a month of our salary during the academic year, and that's worth this much money. But I mean, it's real money, it's just, it's not cash that we pulled out of our wallet. And then there's other, I don't even know the total story there, but I do know that the state kicked in some money to make that match happen. And so it's a fairly substantial investment, but the payoff is much more substantial. It also started a new tradition, which is an annual conference with faculty, students, and industry. And I think that's the magic, that's the, that's the key part, is putting all these people in the same room, giving them something to eat, giving them something to drink, and letting them talk, and not overburdening them with a lot of topics of what they should talk about. And I, I am speaking from experience because I've been part of many of those conferences, and it's my job now to run them. And you see magic happen at those places. You see people standing in the corner going, really? It works like that. Well, what about this? And pretty soon the wheels are turning and they're talking and they're emailing and, the, and then there's a joint proposal that goes in and pretty soon we have another project and that spins out a student that starts a company and the whole thing starts, keeps going. And Rufus, here, here you go, here's, here's young Rufus, <laughs> younger, I guess this is Babbitt and this is Randy Eckwell over at Scientific Materials, I can't tell who is back there. This looks like it might be Shell Crowder maybe? Is that Oh yeah, this is this is this picture is from 1997 according to my records, and so it's 
one of the first Optech conferences. That's not the whole conference. <laughs> <laughs> Just a sample picture. So here's who we are today. And it, you know, who we count sort of depends on who's counting and what day it is. But just sort of nominally, these are the people that, that do optics, directly optics related work on campus. And I have some little blue lines drawn around to indicate fat, uh, departmental affiliations. But that's one of the special things about Optech is that it's an umbrella that brings in everybody and it doesn't matter in what department you're in and I don't really care what department you're in. I don't I don't think that we try to do that, and I don't think universities are unique in doing that, but universities are very good at putting silos around people and keeping them from talking to each other. And so one of the very special things that I recognized on day one, even day minus 100, when I first visited here, was how open those, how porous those boundaries are. And you know, people talk all the time regardless of departmental aff affiliation. Maybe that has something to do with being small, and it's, it's a very important thing. But generally, electrical engineering department up here, physics over here, chemistry over here, and some of these people aren't doing much optics anymore, right? So this guy lives in Montana Hall now, and you know, Lee Spangler also. Lee's, Lee's moved on and done other things, and he doesn't really do optics anymore. But I still claim them because they're, they were ours, and they were very important pieces for a long time of, of who we are. And there's probably people, people I've missed, and if, if you're out there thinking I missed somebody, tell me and I'll, I'll add them. This is the payoff. So this is the money slide. This actually grew out of a slide that Rufus made, gosh, 20 years ago or so, with a linear tra trajectory, and I got to be a wise guy, and I, I made it into an exponential. And I did it primarily because I was running out of room on the slide. And this is, this is the slide that gets people's attention and for very good reason because this shows that what we did worked. And the Big Bang is down here in 1980. And that was the first company. We cannot claim that all of these, you know, it's a chicken and egg problem. We, did the university cause this to happen, or did this cause the university's optics program to happen? And the answer is yes. And there is no one-way thing. Optech officially came along here, but like I explained to you, you know, the, the early work was being done at, down in here at the boundary of the 80s and 90s. And I'm going to tell you some stories about some of these early companies just to give you a little bit more background of that, and then you'll see all these other companies that came along. And there's probably companies that are missing on this. We're, we, co we compare notes all the time. Rufus and me, Randy, we're always emailing back and forth saying, what about so-and-so? And then we'll decide, nah, they're not really optics. We're not going to put them on the slide. What about so-and-so? Oh, yeah, I forgot them. And we'll put them on. So if you see somebody missing, tell me, and I'll put them on. Um, we're now up over 40 optics-related companies here, mainly in Bozeman. So these, I used to have this slide labeled Bozeman Optics Companies, but for two reasons, I've changed it. One is, for political reasons, when we talk to the legislature, it's better to let them know that this is a Montana thing. And number two, it is a Montana thing. There are several companies here that are not in Bozeman, and that's <coughs> a very, very good thing, because that diversification benefits all of us. Okay, I'm going to bring that slide back multiple times and show you, so don't worry, you're going to get to see it again. Um, oh, I just put this up just so you know, when we created Optech, this is what happened to it. John ran it officially from 95, but he was the one, of course, that was the PI, principal investigator, on that proposal, so I'll give him credit at least back <coughs> in 1992. He stepped down from that role in 97, Lee Spangler stepped in, ran it for about six years. And then we had a meeting shortly after I got here to MSU, and everybody turned around at the table and said, he can do it. And so I did it. And I've been in that job. Actually, it's one day, all of a sudden, I realized I've been object director longer than object has existed before me. And so it's kind of a strange feeling. <coughs> but it's, it's a really fun thing, and I really, really highly value this role, because I love to talk about what we're doing and, and interact with people. When, <laughs> One of our, you know, people ask me all the time, what's your magic sauce? What's, what's, what are you feeding these people? What, what's happening? 
there's no magic, but what, if there is magic, it happens here at the annual conference. We have an annual conference with, like I said, students, faculty, and company people. We, we have poster sessions, we have food, we have drink, we have lectures, we have visitors, we bring people in, and it's just really, really important that we do this because these kinds of conversations are happening all the time at that forum. We also bring people in to give talks and to meet us. I've never had somebody come in and talk to us and leave without saying, wow, I had no idea you guys were doing this much cool stuff. Just recently, Jim Wyatt, one of the most famous people in the optics world, was here. Three weeks ago, was it? Something like that? And his email to me the day after he left was, I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember the exact words, but it was basically, I knew you guys were doing something special, but I had no idea how special. And so this is an important part because then people go away knowing us and we know them and we build collaborations outside of the MSU boundaries. Okay, so let's look at a couple of specific examples. If we come back here to what I jokingly call the Big Bang in 1980, let's, let's just think about what, what had to nucleate this thing, what, what had to happen. So Orionics is our first company on the list, 1980 to 1987. Anytime I know that a company stopped existing, I put an end date. And the remarkable thing is how few end dates there are on this chart. I've had business professors tell me that that's wrong. That it has to be wrong because there's no way you can have that high a success rate. And I'm like, well, we're too dumb. We don't know that. And so <laughs> So here's Roger Robichaud, and I'm sorry I don't have old pictures of these people in their prime, but, but I just don't because I, wasn't, I didn't know them at the time. <laughs> this is Roger a couple years ago when we did a video to record. We recorded as much as we could of our history, and I'll give you a link to that later on or a, a, a clue to the link to that. Um, oh, and I'm sorry, I, did I do that? Well, yeah, this is 1987, and I say 1985. I, I made a typo. Roger was working at Sandia National Lab in New Mexico, and he had some ideas for doing splicing of optical fibers, which nowadays is a very normal thing. And John back there could tell us all about that. You know, everybody does this, and it's just routine. 1980, it wasn't routine, especially in the 70s, it wasn't routine. So he started a company, and they, they started making these fusion splicers to splice pieces of optical fiber together so that we can now have this fiber-based internet, for example. And he was in Albuquerque, and all he knew is he wanted to go to the Rocky Mountains. He wanted to, be, he wanted to stay in the Rocky Mountains. He was at the southern end. He wanted to stay somewhere in the Rocky Mountains. He had to be close to a university with solid science and engineering programs because he knew that his company needed graduates to hire and labs to borrow or rent when they had, when the lab had something that he didn't have, and just expertise. He wasn't looking specifically for somebody that had fiber optics expertise, he was just looking for solid science and engineering. His engineer that he stole from Sandia was from MSU. And so that was our lucky day, because the engineer said, hey Roger, let's go to Montana. And Roger said, oh, I like that idea. So they came to Montana, the part of the story that I didn't put in here, but we do have in the video, in his own words, and I'm a little bit embarrassed about that because it's not politically correct, but he said it, is that they, the engineer said, well, I went to school in Bozeman, so let's do something different. Let's go to Missoula. Oh. And they went to Missoula, and they, they drove through town and said, uh-uh, they turned around, they came back. And so this could have all happened in Missoula, and maybe it wouldn't have, though, because they didn't have the the academic <coughs> offerings. So they came and they set up camp in Bozeman. And then he sold, he, he, the story that Roger tells is that he, he said, I made a mistake that I, I put all of our efforts into production instead of R&D. And he says the company grew so fast that it just burned me out. And if you meet Roger, you'll learn very quickly that, yeah, he's not the quintessential businessman. He's not the guy that wants to run a super aggressive business for decades on end. He's the guy that's in the mountains kind of guy. And so he sold his business and he stayed on for a year. They promised to stay in Bozeman. 
And they did until he quit, and then they moved back east in 1987. So that's why there's an end date, and bam, it's, it's gone. So our first company was here, and then it was gone. Second company is Big Sky Lasers, <clears throat> and so let's talk about Big Sky Laser. One year later, after Roger, 1981, very similar story. This guy, younger version of it, this guy, Ed Teppo, was working at the, whatever the naval, it's now called this, and I don't know what it was called back then, but, but it's always been some version of the Naval Weapons Center or something like that in my life, at China Lake. And one of the things they did at China Lake is they tested you know, military laser designators and things like that. And the first thing he learned was that lasers are awful. Lasers break, they don't last. When you beat them up in the field, they don't hold up. And so he said, I can make a better laser. And there's a picture of one of his better lasers. He got an MS in physics at MSU in 1967. So he wasn't from Montana, but he, he had passed through Montana. He worked for the Navy and said, I need better lasers. The Navy needs better lasers. I want to go home to Montana. And so he came home to Montana, started his company, sold it to Quantel. I think I put the wrong date there. Rof Rufus, do you remember? If, is 88 correct or is it 98? Uh, 98 sounds Yeah, so it's possibly 98. I might have a typo here. That seems too early for me. And then these are a couple of pictures of one of my LiDAR systems that my research group has built using one of their lasers. I got to know their lasers very early in the game. I was in the early 90s. I was down in Boulder building LiDARs to go on airplanes. And we would not use anything but a big sky laser because it's the only laser that would come back for more after we beat the crap out of it. And so we used these lasers religiously. And when I came here, I started buying their lasers also. And, and there's one, it's actually a bad picture to use to show, but on the back side of this plate, there's a big sky laser. And that's mounted, this is the picture inside that airplane. And we're flying, in this case, over Flathead Lake. But we built this LiDAR to do mapping of invasive lake trout at Yellowstone Lake. And so you may have heard about that in the news on and off. Anyway, so Ed Tempo's company, he sold it to Quantel, but they are still here in town. And they're now called Lumabird, but they're, they're here in town. They're one of the biggest, strongest companies. OK, so the third company on the list, 1984. So there were a couple year gap. And then TMA Technologies. That one is a particularly interesting story because you, you should have noticed a couple common themes so far. The common theme, the primary common theme is people wanting to come home or people wanting to escape where they were and go to Montana. That's a big part of our thing. Not surprisingly, right? That's why a lot of us are here. So te TMA Technologies is the story of John Stover who came here from the Denver, Colorado area to escape the Denver, Colorado area, <laughs> like a lot of us. And he was teaching in the electrical engineering department. It wasn't ECE at that time. I should have called the EE department. It was just electrical engineering. And he had some experience doing laser scatterometry. And this is a picture of him a couple years ago when we did this video. And this is a picture of the commercial product that came out of his company later. And this is in his own words. He, he said that I, want, I came to Bozeman because it's special. I wanted to ski. I wanted out of traffic and smog in Denver. So there's a common theme there. He was teaching an electro-optics class at MSU in the kind of the, looks like I was going to add the word, the letter, and I missed it, but early 1980s. A retired Air Force general came in and said, hey, I want to start a company. You got any ideas? I got money. And that's not what happens every day. <laughs> and so John tells this great story about sitting at a faculty meeting. Can you imagine this, Rob? Rob, sitting in one of our faculty meetings and having a visitor say, I got money to start a company. Take my money. Yeah, what do you want to do? <laughs> well, not just take it, but do you want to start a company with me? And so that, puts us, that makes us pause. We're really good at spending money on research. It's like, oh yeah, you got money, I'll spend it on, you know, whatever. I've got 10 ideas right now. But companies, yeah, not so much. John, though, knew that laser scatterometry could be a thing, so he talked to them about it, and they started this company, TMA Technologies. 
and he, was sta he stayed at the university. So John was at the university teaching, and in his own words, he says, the budgets were getting cut, we were losing support for our teaching assistants, and he said, it just, I'd go to the company and do research and development, and I had a lot more fun than I had when I was on campus. So I quit. And the way he first told me is he quit the same week he got tenure, which is interesting. Oh. Then later he admitted, well, it may not have been the same week, but it was the same semester. So it was sometime close to the tenure time. When did he work? He stayed in Bozeman. He just left campus. He just he just went. You probably knew John, right? You. I know John actually. I took his office. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get in. That's great. What year did you come here, Hashem? Eighty-seven. Perfect. Yeah. Exactly right. So, around eighty-seven, then John, he resigned right after his tenure. He ran this company and it was a big success. Some of you maybe worked for him, but I've given talks where there were people in town who said, oh, I worked for them for 10 years. And they made these commercial products, they were very successful, and then they got bought out and they got moved to Portland. So you recognize another trend, right? That in these early days, we were losing companies as fast as we were growing companies. And that is a hard way to get established. But it was happening. The interesting thing is, knock on wood, right now that's not happening. Just the opposite is happening now. We are so well known and, and they, the companies that buy our companies tend to say, we like this thing going on in Montana and so they leave them there and then they even bring some new people in sometimes. So that's happening. But now, John, just to tell you the rest of the story, John went on to open up, he hung out his shingle, and he, he started a new company called the Scatterworks, which is formerly a Bozeman company, but pretty soon after he started it, he decided he really wanted to be closer to the, the heartbeat of the optics industry, which is really centered on. The center of the universe for optics is in Tucson, Arizona. So he, he lives in Tucson now, and he runs his company there. Although it came full circle, he told me a couple years ago that he bought his company back, basically. The company in Oregon had gotten tired of it, and so he bought it all back. So he now sort of has the whole thing again. Okay, the next one that, I'm not gonna do all these, by the way. Don't think I'm gonna keep you here till midnight. In fact, we're, we're getting close to the end here, but I'll, I wanted to tell you the first couple of four or five because it's important to lay the trends. And then I can whitewash the rest of them, the rest of it. ILX Lightwave, which is slash Newport, because it was purchased by Newport in recent years, <coughs> came along in 1986. And to me, this is one of the more interesting stories. They're all interesting in their own way, but this is Larry Johnson. ILX Lightwave makes diode laser instrumentation. So it's really more of an electronics company than an optics company, but I claim them because their electronics wouldn't, be, wouldn't exist if it wasn't for optics, and they use optical pieces in their stuff. Okay, so Larry was a PhD student at the University of Arizona, Tucson. That's where I did my PhD also. Different time. It's really interesting that the federal research lab where I worked in the late 80s to 2001, the early 80s, Larry worked at that same lab and shared an office with the person who had an office right next door to me mm -hmm. later. And so there's all these weird woo kind of things that happen. And so I knew about Larry Johnson years before I ever met him because I heard all these stories about, about yeah, Larry, he was in our group, he was doing really cool stuff, and then he left and he went and started a company up in Montana or something. <laughs> and, and I was like, yeah, I know that company. I've got my eye on them because I'd love to go back to Bozeman. And so he fell in love with Bozeman when he came to visit Orionics. He was starting a company in this basement in Minneapolis, and he needed a fiber splicer, Orionics. So he called up Orionics and said, I need whatever, whatever, and I need it this fast, and they said, sorry, we can't do that. But you could come to Bozeman and use our fiber splicer while we build yours. Okay, I'll come to stinking Bozeman while he came to Bozeman, discovered the ski hill, discovered all the cool things that we love about Bozeman, fell in love with it and said, 
heck with Minneapolis, I'm coming here. And so he gave up, um, oh yeah, it looks like I had my order wrong here, but in 1986, then he moved from Minneapolis basement to Bozeman, and he started ILX Lightwave. And they've been, of course, like all companies, through ups and downs, but they're still a very strong company here in town. Um, in 2012, he sold that company to Newport, and then Newport sold it to somebody, and I can't keep track of who's who anymore, but it's still in my mind, I like Slightwave. Okay, the last one that I want to talk about in the beginning phase to get us through the 80s is scientific materials. And that's because it <coughs> takes us back full circle to Ralph. So Ralph is the guy that grew this little laser crystal for Ted Maiman's laser when the laser was invented. And Sorry, I've got a problem up here, so I'll just bring it all up. Ralph, first and foremost, wanted to come home to Montana. He needed proximity to a university with science and engineering, but especially the kind of stuff Rufus does. Now, the interesting thing in Rufus, you can fill us in on the details. Ralph told me he didn't know you, and he didn't know that he was going to have that coincidence, but he said that that was one of the most important things that ever happened is that he happened to land in the same town as you because of what you do in your research lab. And I know you guys have been collaborating forever since then. Well, even before the company got started, we can make them. So how early was that? Well, around 89. Okay. Yeah, because he said, he in my notes from my interview with Ralph, he said that he came here with like a, a phase two SBIR or STTR and that was probably with you. And so he came here with one grant in his pocket and, and grew the company. And then he sold it to FLIR, which is a big, especially well-known, big company especially well-known in the infrared imaging business in 2005. I remember when I heard that news, I've done a lot of infrared imager work over the years, and so I knew FLIR. I remember when that happened, I immediately went out and bought a bunch of FLIR stock. Because I was like, oh, this is interesting. And it's mostly paid off pretty well. <laughs> okay, so I don't have time to take you through all these dots, but I wanted to talk about these two because they're interconnected. Bridger Photonics in 2006 and Blackmore Sensors and Analytics in 2016. What happened is, so far, the story I've been telling you has no classic, we graduated a student and that student went out and licensed technology from the university and started a company. Well, that's because yeah, that wasn't happening yet. But you should have noticed that at least some of these people were our graduates, or our faculty, in the case of John Stover, and they were coming home. That was just as important, that they wanted to be here. And so a lot of these companies came about because of that. Well, that's the key to most of the dots that come after this, is that our students got to know this, and Optech, started putting them in contact so that they knew the presidents and CEOs of the companies in town. And so you graduate a new PhD student, and what does he do? Well, instead of writing an application and going to California or somewhere, we're not picking on California, <laughs> but just wherever, they would go and take somebody out to dinner. And so like, I asked Pete Ruse, who started Bridger Photonics, Pete, tell me how you learned how to run a business because you have a PhD in physics. And he said, I took Larry out to lunch once a week for N months, where N is some large number. And I asked him, how do I solve this problem? And then the next week, how do I solve this problem? And pretty soon he knew how to solve those problems. And Larry is generous with his time, as you can tell. Why would he tell all his secrets to him? this other punk. But that's the other key, that's the other magic sauce that we have here, is that we're talking and we're helping each other all the time. And so, Pete Roos, the PhD graduate who started this company, was a PhD student during these years, the early Optech years. So he was probably at the first Optech conference, I don't know, I should ask him. He, he was in the class that I taught, the very first class that I taught at MSU, he was there. And I just remember saying, man, this is going to be a great gig. These MSU students are 
geniuses. <laughs> and then I went and found out that, well, they're not all that good, but... <laughs> Sorry, <it's laughs> but they're still pretty darn good. But Pete blew my mind because he was a senior PhD student and he's really smart and he just was like, wow, he knew everything. He got, caught on to everything. And my job was easy. And then I learned, yeah, I got to actually do my job. So Bridger Photonics came about because Pete was off doing postdocs in what? He was in Australia for a while. He was in Boulder for a while. And then he, key phrase, wanted to come home. Got married, started having kids, said, I want to raise my kids back in Montana. And so he rang up, I think, Randy Babbitt. He probably called Rufus, too, and he was asking for jobs. Randy gave him a job at Spectrum Lab, which is one of our key organizations that lives right on that boundary between university and industry. And Pete was just a postdoc there, and he basically was doing academic research projects, but at the boundary of, of this industry applications. And then he got the idea, we can do this. And so he started writing proposals with his, with his fellow postdocs, and who used to be fellow PhD students. And they started winning proposals. And so they went 80% university, 20% company. And then pretty soon they were 70% university, 30% company. And eventually they were 100% company and they left the university. That's one of the keys to how we've made this thing happen, is this leveraging of letting people sort of work their way out of a job. And then Blackmore literally was spun out of Bridger because the two guys that started Bridger had different ideas about what they wanted to do. And so eventually they just said, okay, you do this, I'll do that. And so they went off and started Blackmore. Um, and here's a picture. This is Pete as a PhD student. <clears throat> This is Pete as CEO of Bridger Photonics. And I know, because I was there taking these pictures, this was Pete posing in the lab. Because <laughs> CEOs don't spend that much time in the lab. But Pete's still very capable in the lab. And then Stephen and, and Randy, this Randy Rebel here actually started Bridger with, with Pete. And then he went on and with Stephen Crouch and others and started Blackmore Sensors. Blackmore Sensors just this last summer was acquired by Aurora, one of the big self-driving car companies, and you probably read about that in the news. And this is them at Photonics West a year ago or so, getting kind of one of, one of the big awards in, in commercial optics called the, the PRISM Award. Okay, so what I should have done is plug this into the audio, but what I'm going to do instead is, in the interest of time, No, I'm not. I'm having problems with my audio. Oh, maybe that's my problem. Where is it, Rob? There's a volume oh. control that you need to crank up. Yeah, but I'm not plugged into their audio. Oh, the HDMI should. Yeah, you're right. Okay, Pete, say it again. I think both of us went up to 75%, and we were able to hire two critical employees. Uh, but the fact that, that MSU allowed flexibility in, in, in uh, employment was critical for us. And the fact that you know, we could collaborate. MSU had, had uh, you know, personnel ideas and, and uh, the, the infrastructure for doing research that we wanted to do. It, it was a huge asset to have MSU. We couldn't have done it without MSU. There's no doubt. Thank you, Pete. <laughs> There's no check in the mail. <laughs> and then in 2013, after Larry retired and sold his company, I called, actually I emailed Larry, and I said, hey, we've been thinking that we need an industry organization and to represent the, the whole community. And I've been thinking about who could lead it, and we really need somebody with, an, with executive experience in the optics industry. Who might you know that has executive experience in the optics industry and time on his hands. And he laughed and said, yeah, I'm interested. And so he did it. So Larry stepped up. This is, these are pictures from our organization meeting where we came up with the acronym, Montana Photonics Industry Alliance. You can see we almost were, or we could have been, we could have been MPA, MOPA, laser word there, 
We could have been MAP, we could have been all these things, but instead we were MPIA. And now that's the main voice for the optics community in Montana. And then I wanted to just close by telling you that there's a lot of details of this history that we have recorded at great expense of effort by tapping into our film school here. And so rather than giving you URLs, I'll just tell you, I created an account called Montana Optics Videos on YouTube. Go search that and you'll find four or five different videos that I have on there. And there's, there's interviews with John Carlston, Rufus Cohn, uh, John, Ralph Hutchison, Roger Robichaud, and a whole bunch of these guys. And so there's a lot of good stuff. John Stover was, was there. That's when our conference room was the old conference room, Rob. <laughs> and so, conclusion, we invested a bunch of money. The NSF invested a bunch of money. And from that, by doing the right things, we built a world-leading cluster of companies and research capabilities on campus that continue to act as the engine for that, for that cluster. But it's not that easy. It looks like it was easy, but it's not that easy. It requires careful nurturing of a culture and hiring the right people. And so when people ask me what's the real secret, that's the real secret is the culture. And we, we have a culture where the students come in and they recognize it pretty quickly. Visitors come in and they recognize it pretty quickly. And it's, it's something that we're constantly fanning the flames of, is building and keeping this culture going. And that doesn't mean that we don't generate PhDs that go out and take professor jobs. That happens, and that's good. But those who want to start companies leave here knowing that they can. And so they do. And I call it creating a company out of self-defense. They don't want to move, so they create a company so that they can keep their ski pass. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the thing. Lifestyle and quality of life is critical. And if we ever lose that, we will lose our special edge. And so that's, that's the key thing. Thanks very much. And I hope we can chat some more. <laughs> Willie, we do have a time for a few questions. If you need to be on your way, obviously uh, that's fine. But question? Yeah. Out of the companies you showed, they seem to be uh, centered around Bozeman. Uh, how many were in your? How many of those came out of Missoula and uh, and Texas? Yeah. Um, good question. The, the question is, how many of these companies are not Bozeman based? Only a few. I have Scatterworks on here because it's officially a Bozeman company, but it's not located here anymore, so I should really put an asterisk on that one. Sunburst Sensors is a company that is a spin-off from U of M, and it's a guy in the chemistry department that does, um, like, ocean water chemistry, and he does, his company makes optical and electronic sensors to measure water properties. And uh, that's really a great company and a really great story on its own right. And it was only recently that I added them to the list. And it's not because I didn't know them, it's just I had never thought of that. And all of a sudden one day I was sitting in a meeting with him and I was like, I gotta put your company on my slide. And so I did. And so I'm hoping he'll be here for this year's meeting and he'll be impressed that he's part of a big <laughs> community that he doesn't even know yet. And then let's see, there's not very many more. There's Help me out if any of you see some. Um, oh, I know, up here. So Yellowstone Scientific Instruments is like up in Big Sky. Uh, US Optics is one of the few dots that is not a local company. This is a big company that makes rifle scopes. And they opened a branch up in the Kalispell area. And so they're, they're up there. But yeah, hardly any. It's it's almost all, it's almost all uh, Bozeman based, just because of the nature of what we're doing here. Good question. Others? As a historian, I would just commend you for putting this together, and I hope that you will write it all up and make it available because it's a, a really wonderful account. That I've been urging other people on campus to do for 40 years. Is that right? They haven't done it. Yeah. And you have, and it's fantastic. Thanks. I wrote a conference paper.
couple years ago to capture the essence of what I had learned at that point, but I really need to write it a more complete version. Thank you for the compliment and for the encouragement. Joe, do you, do you know Pierce Fallen? I do not. Okay, uh, we'll get to him. Yeah, we'll get to him. Thank you. <laughs> I, I came in 63 when it was Montana State. Wow! <laughs> That's I when it became MSU, I've seen right? the evolution of both AA and physics. I feel like a grand old man watching. Are you in the history department? History and philosophy. History, history and science. philosophy. Yeah. Wonderful. You've seen the history. book, uh, The History of Montana State sure. University? Sure. Thank you. One of the authors. But I'm just <laughs> delighted to meet you. you. You can do, right now, with what you have, a really great short article for the Montana Magazine of History. Yeah, you know I uh, should do that. Concentrate on the earlier period. Yeah. Specifically, Joel, history of science. Yeah. That's great. I'm really glad you took the time to come tonight. Well, Thank I'm really you. glad I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love to get encouraged because there's a lot of forces pulling me different directions, and so thank you. Other questions or comments before we... Uh, what is the Optex budget here? Yeah, so it's interesting that Optech started out as, of course, an, well, actually, there was no, none of that NSF money was used to operate Optech. All that money was spoken for with salaries and whatnot. Um, so I actually, Rufus, you might know, but my guess is that it was funded, the operations, whatever little bit there was, was funded out of the VPR office. There was a secretary and that was it. Yeah. And that's still pretty much, we're very lean. We have me as a part-time director and then we have a part-time admin assistant. And that's pretty much it, except for then we have a budget for bringing people in and for, travel, for traveling to different events. And so we, we get that money every year from the Vice President for Research Office. So from the beginning, so it's MSU. MSU. Yeah, it's MSU money that operates Optech, but not really, right? It's, it's MSU's uh, indirect costs on research grants. So every year I have to write an annual report, and I'm always very, very clear to point out right up front, we received this much, and we generated this much, and so, yeah, we're spending a tiny fraction of the overhead that we bring in, is what we're doing. Secretary but good question. Half time at the beginning and still is. Yeah, we haven't grown in administration really, so that's that's kind of the way it is. The job I have to say is starting to really grow. I the amount of hours that I spend just meeting with. It's interesting that the piece that has grown really fast in recent years is companies from out of state coming in and wanting to tap into our market. And so they sit down with me and you know every hour that I spend is an hour I'm not doing my other job. And I'm spending many hours a month doing that kind of work and visiting them around the country. It's, it's growing, so we might have to up that job, but it's right now it's still a very part-time job. Okay, one last question. If you have other questions and don't want to keep people holding on, just come up and talk to me. I'll hang around as long as you want. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Joe.